Okay, so a good morning once again to all of us. It's 11.05. And so we are starting our meeting. And I am happy that all of you have been able to be part of this conversation. I would like to ask Taremwa to please stop drawing, uh, drawing pictures on, um, on our board. But for everyone, we currently have approximately 97 participants on the chat. So thank you very much for all making time away from your busy schedules to be part of us in this conversation. Um, for a few housekeeping rules, uh, I would just like to ask that we keep our microphones on mute. And in case you're having internet challenges, it's okay, you can take off uh, your video, but it's also a good thing to see our faces. And I know that we are being joined by people from across Uganda, but also from across the continent. So thank you very much once again. Our agenda is on the, is on the screen for sharing. And in case you're wondering about uh, time allocations, we will have welcome remarks from Moses. And then uh, we will have uh, a presentation from Ms. Jackie Asimwe and Mr. Arthur LaRocque that will take 15 minutes each, so we shall have 30 minutes of that presentation. And then we'll have rejoinder statements from uh, Ms. Prima Kwagala and Mr. Benson Ekwe that will take approximately uh, seven minutes each. We should be able to open the conversation up to the audience at exactly um, midday 10, and we should be closing the session by exactly 1 p.m. So within the chat section, I invite everyone to please tell us who they are and where they're coming from so that we are at peace with who we have. And without much further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Moses Isoba, who is the Executive Director of the Uganda National NGO Forum to please join us and make his welcome remarks. Moses, you're very much welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella. And a uh, very big welcome to everybody. Uh, glad to to e-meet everybody here. I see that we are now at 106 uh, participants. So thank you, thank you. Thanks for making for the, the time uh, to all of you, uh, the participants. And, uh, and of course, a special uh, thank you to the panelists, those who will be sharing with us uh, uh, their experiences. And so, yeah, thanks for making the time really uh, for us at the Uganda National Energy Forum, we are alive to the fact that these are very unprecedented times. And so to be able uh, to see you here that you've made the time, we're not taking that for granted. Uh, first of all, uh, please allow me to uh, extend my, uh, as an as organization, our sincere condolences to those that may have been one or another been bereaved. Uh, we know that we've gone through fairly difficult past three weeks. And uh, to those that might have been uh, sick or uh, you know, in one or another sick, we wishing you a very uh, quick uh, recovery. Uh, because these are very unprecedented times, uh, there is certainly a need for us working in a different way. And, and as a Ghana National Energy Forum, we thought that it would be uh, good to have this conversation now where we as uh, uh, leaders of the sector and those uh, that may not be necessarily leaders, but even outside the sector can have, you know, just take off time to think what does it mean really to have a resiliency and to remain relevant uh, during this time uh, of, of the pandemic. Uh, since when the president uh, uh, slapped on, on the country, the movement control order as uh, an attempt or an effort to contain the pandemic, I know that, you know, that certainly has changed our lives. We, as organizations, we've had to reframe our, our, our activities. We've had to repurpose our, on our project objectives and even change the way we are working. And uh, definitely to be able to do that would call for us as uh, CSOs to, to do some extra thinking, to do some extra reflection on how can we be resilient in these times? How can we be relevant uh, in the times like this? 
And of course, also we remain acutely uh, alive to the fact that with the movement control in place, uh, different uh, you know, rights or freedoms have uh, been curtailed. And as organizations that are, some of us are working in areas of uh, influencing democracy and governance and making sure that we're opening up spaces and our operating environment, these are times that are fairly difficult. And therefore we hope that you know, this conversation uh, will be able to, at the end of it all, that will live uh, in a way that at least we know how we can navigate in these uh, uh, difficult times. And so I know that we only have only two hours for this conversation. So without uh, any further ado, I would like to, to thank you, uh, uh, thank everybody, and uh, just return this to our moderator, Isabella. Thank you for taking the time for moderating this. And so uh, thank you, everybody. Welcome to this uh, uh, CSO Leaders Reflection Dialogue on CSO resilience and relevance in the face of the pandemic. Karibu sana. Thank you, Isabella. And thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Moses, uh, for your kind remarks. And I hope that everyone who is listening in has uh, carried on a little bit about why this conversation is important, especially within the context of the pandemic and not just for the sector. It's also about why we should be resilient and why we should be relevant even to the state, but also to the people that we work for and on whose behalf we do our work. And so now more than ever, the conversation on CSO relevance and resilience is important. And without wasting any more time, we have two, um, we have two members from the sector who will be presenting to us. That is Ms. Jacqueline Asimwe and Mr. Arthur Laro. And I would like to uh, introduce uh, Ms. Jacqueline Asimwe, who is going to be talking to us about uh, surviving inside to thrive outside and being anti-fragile. Ms. Jacqueline Asimwe is a Ugandan lawyer. She is a philanthropy advisor for all of us who might be wondering a lot about philanthropy, but also about how to exist uh, in this time of reducing incomes. She's also a leadership coach and a social development thought leader. Ms. Jacqueline Asimwe is the current chairperson of the East African Philanthropy Network. And more importantly, she is the chief executive officer at CIVSOS Africa, which I believe many of us have been privileged to interact with. Jackie, you are very much welcome to submit. Over to you. Is Jackie with us? Yes, I am. I am ah, so sorry. It's My apologies. Your voice. You're very much welcome. <laughs> of course, just as 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 Moses was winding up my hmm, and I have like three gadgets here with internet. You can't imagine. I think that's part of the resilience we are talking about. <laughs> but you are very much welcome to submit. Thank you. So I am the one supposed to be speaking, am I? Pardon? Am I the one supposed to be speaking? Yes. Yes. You're supposed to be coming on right now. Okay, I am so sorry again. And uh, good morning, colleagues, good morning, friends, neighbors, in-laws, brothers and sisters. I'm happy to be here this morning uh, to talk about something I think that we've all grappled with in the last one and a half years. And in a sense, I feel like I do not have answers. I am merely raising questions for us to ponder together as a collective. I think one clear fact is that ordinarily cannot be in the civil society space in a context like ours and not be resilient. So, you know, I, I'm putting that on the table as, 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 as first order of business. In a space where we work where there's shrinking political space, where there's unstable and short-term funding, where we work in contexts of poverty and our global positioning as third world, where there's political volatility and instability, you cannot but be resilient. And so in a sense, I think we're not coming at this as though we do not have a template. We, we have to be resilient in order to work in contexts like ours, in order to work on issues like we do in order to speak truth to power, 
in order to defend rights, in order to expand the rights that are defended. So I think we already come at this with a template. But then, of course, enter COVID-19. And it's a different kind of space because, in a sense, the whole world literally stood still. In one moment, the whole world was literally upended. And so for the few minutes that I have to have this conversation, I wanted to look at what was happening inside. And by inside, I mean inside our organizations, inside our sector. And Arthur, my colleague, will talk about our resilience as expressed externally. I often, um, just because of you know, the way I am, um, the work that I have done, I often look at what is happening on the inside because what happens on the outside is truly an expression of who we are and how we are on the inside. And that's why I decided to delve in there and look at what was happening. I think we were, not I think, we were all dealing with uncertainty, of course. And as leaders, we were facing the decision, dis, facing decision making in ways that we hadn't done before. And it tested our ability and capacity to make decisions every day, all day, in the moment. What were these decisions about? One of the big decisions I think we had to make or think through was about our human resource. We had to grapple with, especially in the first wave of COVID and the first lockdown, and of course it continues up to now, but we had to face and address what does mental health and wellness mean? Yes, we had had conversations about it, but maybe not as deep as we should have. And I think collectively we faced this conundrum. What does mental health and wellness mean? And why does it become critical for civil society on the inside in order to, for us to be well enough to act on the outside? And I'm sure many of us have various examples of how we tried to address and confront that issue, as well as support our staff members to grapple with what, we, what, what the unknown was. The other, of course, was now that we were working at home, what did care look like? At least I know that I struggled with that because a leader's first call is to, be, to, to care for the people that they lead. And so what does caring mean and look like when everybody is at home? when everybody is dealing with particular situations at home, because in, when you come to the workspace, the assumption is, it's, is that it's a level playing ground. You don't see what everybody brings, but now suddenly at home you realize, oh, I have someone who has five children, they live in a one bedroom house. I have another person who is dealing with an aging parent who they are taking care of. I have another staff member who is dealing with, um, so many things. And so I think in a sense, the whole person was brought into our virtual office spaces, our virtual minds as we were leading this time. And so when you're not just caring for the individual, when you know that that individual brings with them their whole network of things that they are dealing with as they are trying to do work, how do leaders care and keep connected in such a situation. And it will be interesting to hear, what did we do? What did you do? How did that fact, how did you address that fact? Because now you're not just caring for the 10 or 12 or two um, staff members that you have. You're literally caring or starting to see them located in their specific homes and, and the other things that they deal with. I think it brought to us our ethos around work and what we work, what we value as work, or who we value when work is happening. At least I know I had to confront that question when suddenly you're all working virtually, but what does your gate man do? 
what does your front desk person do? Because ordinarily their role is to serve the guests, is to make sure the office is, is neat and tidy and you know the stationery is, 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 is all there for us. So in a space where everybody is at home, what does work mean? And how do you value what each team member brings? So valuing work and what our ethos around work is and who we value and how we express that value. There was also the whole area around healthcare issues. And I know that we all grapple with this. Some of us can afford health insurance. Some of us literally can't. It falls apart at that point. And maybe it is time for a new conversation amongst ourselves about how do we access healthcare for all our staff members? Can we afford it? Can we start to lobby for affordable healthcare options? For affordable healthcare options. And what does that look like? I think this is one of the things that the COVID-19 pandemic brought front and center. How do we support the practical needs of staff? Because it's one thing to assume I pay them a salary, you know, they have work to do. But again, when COVID locates them in their situation while they are trying to do work for the sector, suddenly, you know, maybe one of my staff members might go hungry tonight. Maybe one of my staff members might not be able to actually meet their rent this month. So how are we set up to meet practical needs? Do we even think about them? Has the COVID situation enabled us think about those things? If you remember in the first COVID lockdown, there were issues around workers demanding that NSSF consider some relief funds. I don't remember very well that we were engaged with that conversation. And yet I know many of us will remit NSSF. So what does it mean to start to think of us as a collective of workers and how we can start to lobby that the National Social Security Fund indeed works for workers at points when workers needed to work for them. What does that conversation look like? What are we going to do going forward? I think COVID challenged our own disaster preparedness. You know, how many of us were prepared? How many of us have put in place policies, practices to address disaster preparedness? Assuming, and I think we can safely assume that COVID is not the last of the disasters that we will face globally. I'm sure there are more to come. So what can we learn from this that can enable us and strengthen our disaster preparedness? I'm wondering if you, if like me, you thought about the whole question of our overheads. We couldn't go to work but we still have to pay that rent. We still have to keep those lights on. We still have to pay those water bills. At, at least I really questioned, are these overheads worth it? Is there another way? We've often talked about, you know, can we group offices together? Can we share certain facilities and utilities? And I think for me, COVID the moment to answer those questions that, Sometimes we've asked in the abstract, but I think this presents a new way of thinking about what we are like individually, but also as a collective. What does it mean to rationalize our money and our spending on overheads? What does that look like? How do we become better stewards of entrusted resources? Of course, we were all faced with the question of our IT capability and capacity. You know, when um, for some people, lockdown literally meant we, we couldn't be in contact with our other team members. We couldn't hold meetings. We couldn't, the, it was literally a cutoff point for many. So yet knowing that IT is very critical to how we are and how we are living now, what does that look like? And how do we increase and improve our IT capacities going forward? In this second wave, in terms of caring, 
many people are dealing with grief and death. Indeed, as Moses alluded to as he started this morning. So I ask us again, are we reviewing our grief policies? What are the ways that we now support our staff members as they go through this? There's an interesting conversation that I was part of and um, someone said that COVID is not just a sickness of the body. It also takes heavy emotional toll. So what does it mean as people grieve through these things and how as workspaces, as civil society organizations, how do we support grief in meaningful ways? There is of course our ever present existential threat around me that, that has always been and will always be at the back of our minds. But when the taps dry, will we only cry? Or is it time to rethink how to support with everything we have, the resilience mechanisms that we have set up, one of them being NAFASI, which is a cooperative for NGO workers. How many of our staff members, how many of us are members of NAFASI, which in my mind was supposed to be part of the fail safe when things go bad, at least our workers are saving and they have something to fall back to. So maybe it's time to rethink how we engage with NAFASI. We also started Ujasiri, and this is a fund that is supposed to support organizations stand through hard times. But how many of us know about, how many of us contribute to Ujasiri? So it's not that we haven't even tried these mechanisms before, it's just, can we actually believe in them and make them work for us? Because hard times are still coming, that I can assure us. So how do we support our own resilience mechanisms, which are Siri and Nafasi being one of them? And I know that in the women's rights movement, we've also often talked about funding our own movement. But what does that look like and how do we actualize it in a time like this? Uh, Chris, I will ask you show, um, to, to put on the screen for everyone to see something that I had sent you. I think when the world stopped last year, one of the things that we all looked to or that we were all aware of was nature and the things around us. And as I end my comments, it is to ask what are those things that we can learn from nature? What was nature teaching us even through this hard time? So the first one is, is the cactus that I point to. A cactus stores water in its spine, and the spine, of course, we all know we all have spines, but it's to stand up, keep upright. And so my question to us is, what is our system of support? What holds us as civil society when everything apart? What are those things, people values, those mechanisms that we fall back onto when things are apart? What is the span that keeps us upright? The succulent stores water. Succulent is, 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 is another kind of plant and it stores water for hard times in order to keep it healthy and growing. And so for us, what is our expression of storage of water? What are the ways that we store that enable us go through hard times? What are those things that we store as a collective or as individual organizations here that keep us going through hard times? There's something that I recently learned um, about bees and it's, it's, the, it's called shimmering solidarity. And I wondered about the quality of our solidarity in civil society. I'll just read for us very briefly what shimmering solidarity is. Honeybees flip their abdomens upwards in split second synchronicity to produce a wave-like pattern called shimmering in order to repel against predators such as hornets. The shimmering mechanism is both sophisticated and magical demonstrating the bee's remarkable capacity 
for rapid communication and coordination for aligned action. Shimmering is an anti-predatory response which works by confusing and disorienting its opponents through collective movement, making the many appear as one. And as I read this, I thought to myself, do we have that in our system as we think of resilience and relevance as a sector? Do we have a mechanism that enables rapid communication and coordination in these hard times for aligned action? As I sat there grappling with my issues as a leader of my institution, I wondered what are the other leaders thinking about and going through but how do I reach out? Who do I reach out to? Will other leaders want to share? Will we want to be vulnerable with each other so that we can coalesce together and move this forward so that we are resilient together? I wondered, and maybe many of us sat in our corners wondering. So coming out of this, how can we improve our rapid communication and coordination for aligned action? How can we move as though we are one? And the last one is the tree. I have a tree in my compound and, and it, sitting here at home working, people observe that in some the leaves fall and in their place grow other greener leaves of a different color than those that have stayed. And I thought to myself, you know, when we are building resilience, it's often easier to try to hold and hoard and hold. But I think to be resilient, to think of what are those things we need to let go that are no longer serving us? And I think I talked about some of them. What are the things that we as a collective, we as institutions, as a sector, what are those things that are no longer serving us that we need to let go? And how do we let go of them graciously and honorably acknowledging that they have served us, but in a new world, they won't serve us anymore. And then finally, last night, I read something that I thought I would end with as I end my comments today. And this is what it is. The world is not in chaos, we are. The world's apparent chaos is only a reflection of our inner turmoil. If the world reflects a lack of good sense, it's because each of us reflects the same. If the world acts as if it doesn't know what it's doing, it's because each one of us acts the same. If the world is violent and green and often just plain stupid, it is because you and I are that way. So if the world is, to, is going to be changed, we must first change our lives. Unfortunately, we haven't been taught to think that way. We are an out there society, accustomed to thinking in terms of them against us. We want to fix the world, yet remain the same. And I asked if we are that as a sector. And yes, does the world need fixing? Indeed it does. That's why we are all doing the work that we need to do. But often is it that we jump there and forget that there are things that we need to fix ourselves. Because unless we do, the chaos will remain. And we can't afford this kind of chaos much longer. We are simply running out of time. I thank you all for listening to me. Uh, thank you very much, Jackie, for your kind and always refreshing remarks. Uh, for the people that have just joined us, a quick summary on what uh, Ms. Jackie Nasima was talking about. She was looking at a topic uh, called anti-fragile, surviving inside to thrive outside. And part of the highlights from her, from, uh, from her presentation were around mental health and wellness and what it means for us internally as institutions. Two, she talked about um, output beyond, um, uh, not, not output, but care beyond what we have been used to. So how do you care for your staff to the extent of their families so that they are still safe? And what does that mean for our resources as an institution? She also talked about health costs 
which I believe a lot of us might be struggling with, especially institutions that are either young or are already grappling with uh, financial challenges. Uh, they uh, she also talked about psychosocial uh, support for staff, but also practical needs for the staff within our institutions. Uh, she also highlighted the fact that the pandemic has challenged our own disaster preparedness. And one of the things that caused me to smile was the fact that we have so many policies, and I do not know how many of us had a disaster policy and how that is acting out right now within the context of this pandemic. Um, an interesting one uh, was, uh, the, was the conversation around overhead costs and how we are managing that internally. Uh, also around rationalizing the budget, but very key also is the issue of IT compatibility and capacity for institutions, especially now that we have this entire concept of working from home. Uh, there was also a question around revisiting and reviewing of our grid policies as institutions, which is something that this second wave has forced us to rethink. And lastly, our own internal resilience uh, mechanisms. So for those of us who have joined, we will have time uh, towards the end to interact and maybe you can share your experiences with all of us, but also the chat box is open for us to uh, highlight some of the issues that will be coming our way, but also in regard to Jackie's conversation. Uh, Jackie you highlighted issues around internal resilience and relevance. And it's at this point that I will bring in uh, Mr. Asha Laro. Mr. LaRoque is a Federation Development Director at ActionAid International. He's formerly the Country Director of ActionAid Uganda, and he's been very instrumental in shaping citizen movements against corruption. He remains active in the growing struggle against various forms of injustice within uh, Uganda and beyond. Uh, it's always a pleasure to drink from Arthur's brain, and so Arthur, you're very much welcome to this reflection dialogue, which I believe is key. Arthur shall be talking about building external resilience and relevance um, for us as a, as a sector. Arthur, you're very much welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Always nice to connect with you all. I hope you can uh, hear me and see me. I'm just looking at myself on the screen. Thank you for removing me. Um, so I will spend the next few minutes really just ref sharing some reflections. But before that, I need to give some pretext uh, to what I'm going to say. It's always nice to connect with fellow strugglers um, like you and I everywhere around the world, especially uh, when we speak uh, with people from our common heritage called Uganda. I draw a lot of inspiration from people at the front line. So I was really delighted to see names like Prima and, uh, and Benson, um, just to learn from them and the experiences that they do have on the front line. And all of you indeed is, is really, really always um, a reason to be inspired. This is particularly important because many of us uh, who are so-called you know, spe external speakers, we come from a place of privilege. So we, I, I, I must be humble and accept that uh, from where I speak, I think I'm very much privileged. So it is to understand what those in the front lines are going through. And that is where the impulses for change might come and impulses for solutions that we, we, can, uh, we, can, uh, we can offer to the world and to our communities. Secondly, let me just um, reflect on the framing uh, again, because of the privilege that I have, um, I can afford to alter the topic that uh, Chris shared with me uh, on what I should speak about. So it was building civil society external resilience in the face of the pandemic. Uh, but because I am from a humble background, I decided not to throw away Chris's topic, but rather um, add a prelude to it. So what I will be speaking about is reframed as follows. Do not waste an opportune crisis, civil society resilience and relevance in the face of a global pandemic. So it's, it's strange, but I do think that um, the COVID pandemic, the crisis that we are going through is an opportune one for real change um, in our world, in our communities. And I will be speaking to that. And if I failed you know, to cover 
all that needs to be covered. I, I have a short paper, like I always try to prepare that I will share with the NGO forum and NGO forum can share with everybody. Uh, so that, that will be the framing of my uh, conversation. And yes, Benson, I hope she is around. So Roti hasn't just grown from being up country. Benson the other day told us I am no longer introduced as I'm from up country because Soroti is a city. Uh, so, so indeed, Soroti is not just a, a city, but it's part of the global um, uh, you know, situation that we now reflect on as part of this um, conversation on the pandemic, in the context of the pandemic. So um, I was brought up in a very uh, traditional education system. So we were told for each and every topic that you are addressing, first underline the keywords. Uh, and so just give me a second. Yeah, first underline the keywords. So the words that I've underlined are opportune crisis, resilience, relevance, and then um, the global pandemic. And I will speak to some of this and, and connect it with the whole question about relevance and, uh, and resilience. So the crisis we face today is an opportunity. That's my first message. In his book, Inventions That Change the World, a guy called Rodney Castleden catalogs numerous, numerous human inventions that we often today now just take for granted. This isn't the time to go through all of these inventions, but I'll just mention a few. In the ancient world, um, we talked about, you know, the early people, the homo sapiens, you know, that we, we've learned about in history. They invented stone tools. They were responding to a crisis at that time. That's about 500,000 BC. As a multi-purpose tool to survive a very harsh environment that they found themselves in. In 38,000 BC, we invented the paint. Painting, painting, 38,000 BC. Just imagine what crisis we would have if there was no color you could not separate this from the other. It would be a major, a major crisis, but that was um, an invention that today we just take for granted. In um, the medieval times and Renaissance times, we talked about the invention of the clock. So we are supposed to meet at 11. So if there was no clock, who would, who would tell us it's 11 o'clock, you know? So we would have a major crisis with this meeting. We invented in uh, the medieval times as well, anesthesia. Anesthesia, for those who have gone through surgery, you know very well that uh, imagine if you didn't have anesthesia before going through surgery, what, what would happen in terms of the pain and agonies we have, to, we have to go through. There are many, many inventions. The point I am making here, because there is no time, there are the inventions in the enlightened period, the inventions that uh, in the 19th century, there are inventions um, in the modern world, the aeroplane, the email, Windows 95 that all of us are using. All of these were responding to. So my point is the COVID pandemic is a crisis and opportunity which should lead to some inventions and, um, and, and, and we can play a role. It's not about the scientists just. It's also about local ways in which our communities are demonstrating resilience and surviving this pandemic. So COVID, the pandemic is a crisis and opportunity because one, it has exposed our broken and often touted development paradigm where capital has triumphed over labor in the last few decades, where private has been privileged over public. It has turned all of these things upside down. The essential workers that we talk about today in many places are those that we previously looked down upon. So the cleaners, they are essential workers, the cleaners, not the CEO. Nurses are now essential workers, not lawyers, okay? So it has turned our world upside down and made us discover what is really important. This we cannot miss as an opportunity. COVID has exposed the folly of global solidarity as we have thought about before. What we are seeing now, what some people have called the vaccine appetite and nationalism 
has exposed the hypocrisy that we have in the world today. We should not lament about it like the ruler over Uganda was, you know, in a summit in Munyonye a few days, a few weeks ago, when he was lambasting the West. We should look at this as an opportunity to discover what it is we need to do differently and disengage from over-dependence. COVID has made us realize different ways in which local communities can be resilient. Something that we have sacrificed in the past and we thought, oh, well, that doesn't, we've taken for granted. So this is an opportunity to tap into these realities that we now are confronted with. So resilience is about our ability to rise and prosper after the shock of the pandemic that is affecting us in unprecedented ways. Both those who have lost loved ones, like Moses has said, but also those that cannot go to the bar. They are affected, they are not sick, but they can't go and drink in the bar. That's a crisis for many people. So everybody has been affected one way or another. So we need to look at this collective trial that we are facing as a people and collectively triumph as a people. So resilience is about both internal and external factors. My uh, fellow conspirator, Jackie, has already talked about the internal, so I will focus a bit on the external. The external is about the change we would want to work towards in trying to redress some of the things that this pandemic has exposed. A few of them are highlighted, but you know very many uh, others as well. But the brokenness in our society, the inequality in our society, the hypocrisy of those that we've called friends and partners, and the colossal failure of governments across the world. These are the external things that we must be responding to as civil society if we are to be relevant, but also overcome the resilience, uh, overcome the, the, the trauma that we are all going through. So let me just highlight these four uh, points that I've spoken about, and I will end with a few uh, pointers on around, around um, our relevance uh, moving forward. And of course, I'll make some concluding remarks much later when uh, we have an opportunity to also respond to comments from all of you. So the first one is the public uh, health infrastructure that we have just seen is broken. Now, we have more MPs today in Uganda than ICU beds. Okay, that's a fact. How did this get exposed? Yeah, we got exposed because people are dying, no oxygen, basic things, you know, that we should be getting from plants. We have destroyed our plants. Nobody has oxygen, you know. So this, this is just an obvious thing that we've taken for granted before. The budget of state house is higher than the daily budget. budget uh, the daily budget, Benson will tell you, of state house is higher than all the referral hospitals combined every day. You know, this is what we, we need to wake up to. We need to wake up to. Our system was broken before. It was not overwhelmed by COVID. It was simply exposed by COVID. So that is an opportunity for us to develop a new narrative around which we bring back the public um, infrastructure that helps people that have no insurance. Okay. Secondly, inequality is rife in our world. But the question is, who is dying? Of course, the public media, WhatsApp, and all of these social media have been awash with high profile people who have died. Okay. Many people, and that is part of the inequality we are talking about. We know hundreds of relatives and, you know, friends who are dying, but you never hear of them because they are not worth reporting by the public media. So the inequality crisis that uh, has been exposed to see how we best can respond to how um, our society has just been disorganized over uh, decades and decades. So today, we know, we know that in Canada today, they are considering vac uh, you know, vaccinating 12-year-old children 
okay? They are second jobs. They are thinking about second jobs for 12 year old children. In most of Africa, health workers have not even got the first job. Forget about health workers in hospitals. Think about community workers who are the real frontline people. They are not even dreaming about vaccine. So if vaccine is the solution, it is going to be a solution for some people, not for everybody. So this is a big issue that we need to deal with. So all of us who have been working on inequality, this is an opportunity to share the light on the racist system that we are all part of. So that's the other thing. The third one is the hypocrisy that uh, we have been accustomed to. So we talk about solidarity organizations such as the one that I work for, we say, oh, our currency is solidarity. But where are we at this moment when Africa cannot get vaccines and we cannot do anything about it? It's a very, very humbling question for all of us. So instead, we are amassing huge public debt and we are compromising our future 50 years from now. Our children's children will be paying debt that we have got as a result of this pandemic. UDN will tell us that we are not just talking about unsustainable debt levels, we are really talking about a resurgence of a form of colonialism that we haven't seen before. So just wait, if we don't confront and have a huge people's movement against debt again, just like we had in the 90s, we will have crisis with unimaginable public health consequences for the future. This is an agenda we need to construct a movement around. Colossal failure of our governments is the fourth and last point I want to make before I make some closing remarks around the relevance question. So the PS of Ministry of Health, I just don't even want to mention her name. She says, stop, stop calling us thieves. Then someone asks the question, but who stole the COVID money? Then she answers, I say, don't call us thieves. We are not thieves. We all know how much money has been borrowed how much money has been collected through yes, some of your contributions and how much money has been stolen and cannot be accounted for. So this pandemic has exposed a rotten government that we have. A government that is not only corrupt, but might actually be colossally incompetent. So this is the opportunity to remobilize politically and say we should reclaim the state which will outlive governments, we should reclaim the state from corrupt, incompetent government that we have in our own country and in many other countries that are taking advantage of this pandemic and instead amassing wealth for themselves. So this, this exposure of the pandemic has just is not something new. It's just gone to proportions that we cannot have imagined before. So this is the challenge that is before us as civil society. So on the question of relevance and just a few points as I close, first of all, if we are really worried about COVID, let me puncture your hearts a bit. The key question is, after this phase of COVID is done, are we prepared for the next pandemic? Not enough discussion has taken place about where COVID came from. COVID is not a natural situation. It was created. And if it doesn't serve the purpose of the creators, they will come up with something else. I'm not a conspirator. I'm not just engaged in conspiracy. This pandemic is part of a process to control and to reset the world. So the question is, if we survive this pandemic as civil society, as a people, are we prepared for the next one? We should keep this at the back of our mind as we respond to the immediate challenges that we do face. This is the question. So Jackie talked about local solidarity. COVID has made us understand that we should invest in local solutions in communities and in our country. We all locked up. In many countries where ActionAid operates, we have repurposed 
our programming and just started delivering, you know, public health information, all of this in local communities. You imagine if you are a global organization that is not rooted in communities, you are irrelevant. So the challenge for us as civil society organizations, as we talk in Kampala and in urban areas, supposing you are locked up, like the president of Uganda has locked us up in the last 48, uh, I mean, the last, I do not know how many weeks. What else can you do if you can't travel? If you are not an essential worker? The, question, the, 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 the point I am making is we should be local in our approaches, even as we connect globally, solutions for our survival are going to come from the local because communities cannot move anywhere else. They just have neighbors and they have to find solutions. So if this pand if anything had not made us realize the importance of being rooted, let this pandemic remind us. So this solidarity that we are talking about should lead to self-sufficiency, inventions that we talked about earlier that will give us the solutions that are required without having to depend on the West. We should be able to generate knowledge for now and the future. We should not be like the French who, you know, learned nothing in the 19th century and forgot nothing. I think there is so much that is happening to us now that we can ill afford not to document and not to learn from. Civil society can be an important player in generating this knowledge through communities that will help us thrive in the future. We should reclaim the state from the government that has presided over it for a long time. Because the state seems to be failing, but it's really those who are in charge that have made it so. So this is the political message we need to get to make sure that we are relevant for the future. So it goes beyond repurposing, goes beyond adaptation. It, it talks about what we need to reclaim to get charge, to, 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 uh, to take full charge of our own destiny. So in conclusion, let's take stock of all the agonies and pains that we've had, but also pick the important lessons. So civil society, I would challenge the NGO forum to think through the major themes of lessons and experiences that we are coming up with during this pandemic and develop ways in which we, we strengthen our own resilience, building on the realities that we have learned from our people who every single day are fighting to live the next day. There is so much we can learn from ourselves and less from the West who have turned against the rest. Let me leave it here for now and then come back later uh, and interact. Like I said, um, pick lessons and inspirations from all of you. So back to you, Isabella. Thank you very much, Arthur, for your kind and quite elaborate uh, submissions. Thank you for your eye-opening submissions. Uh, just in the same breath as Jackie, you have, you have managed to provoke our minds. For those of us who may have joined in, Arthur repurposed his topic. And here you have a state to read, um, do not waste an opportune crisis, CSO resilience and relevance in the place of the pandemic. Are there are four issues that Arthur's submission touched. That was one, the issue of brokenness. Two, the issue of inequality. The issue of hypocrisy came in as the third issue. And the fourth issue was the colossal failure of governments around the world. In, um, in responding, to his topic, Arthur highlighted the brokenness of the health system and how it's an opportunity for the sector to rethink our discussions around inequality as well as our work around inequality. He also talked about hypocrisy, especially around the vaccines and how we must rethink the conversation around racism, but I think also that conversation around classism which you did not mention, but it clearly came out in your submissions. Um, the third area that Arthur highlighted in regard to response was an opportunity that the pandemic gives us to mobilize politically and regain um, state from an incompetent government, which I think is something that a lot of governance organizations have been struggling with in the past. 
Um, a very key question from uh, Arthur's submission. Isabella is muted. Isabella, you're muted. <laughs> uh, but why did the NGO forum mute me? Anyway, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but uh, there was also a conversation around uh, the next pandemic, and I hope that the NGO forum in this dialogue series can be able to uh, to propose or to organize one on that. Um, second, lastly, was the conversation around repurposing our, our programs to suit community. And I think Arthur gave us a very key uh, example on that matter. And lastly, there was a call for us to take stock and keep important lessons uh, from the pandemic as a sector. So thank you very much, Arthur, for your submissions. Uh, on this note, I'd just like to recognize partners that are joining us from across Uganda. I have seen Farpad from Lira. We have representation from the Blue NGO Forum. We have Kavari that you have represented. Um, we have DJ in the house. We have uh, Paconet all the way from Halisa. And of course, a special shout out to my friend, John Seguja, all the way from Luero. The pandemic has sure and kept you away, uh, but it's good to see you, John. Uh, also, I'd like to recognize the presence of Mr. Richard Sewachilianga, who is the former executive director of the Uganda National NGO Forum. Thank you very much for joining us on this call. I'd also like to recognize uh, Sarah Mukasa, Rita Achio, Claire Leduc from uh, the French Embassy, Zahara Nampeo, and um, uh, Sisi Kagawa from Aku, we also have Joseph Munyangabo from the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. And a lot of you, we recognize and respect and celebrate all of you that have uh, told us where you're coming from and, 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 um, and the amazing work that you're doing. I would have happily read out all the names, but we are quite a number. And so I will just leave it at that. And so moving on to the next uh, session, we are going to be looking at uh, sharing of organizational experiences and we'll be hearing from two people. We'll be hearing from Ms. Prima Kwagala, who is Executive Director of the Women's Pro Bono Initiative. Uh, I don't know what to say a lot about Prima, but she's an amazing person. She's also someone I'm honored to call a friend. So Prima, you're very much welcome and thank you for the amazing work you're doing around providing uh, legal aid and support uh, to very many women in this country. We'll also be hearing from Mr. Benson Nekwe, who is from uh, the Public Affairs Center in Soroti, the one that has become a city. He will remind us it has become a city when he comes on. So don't be very shocked at that when he comes. So without wasting any more time, Prima, you're very much welcome to share uh, your organizational experiences as a um, during this pandemic season. Thank you so much, Isabella. My name is Prima Koagala. I'm a lawyer and also the team leader at the Women's Pro Bono Initiative. Uh, the Women's Pro Bono Initiative is a women-led women's rights organization which envisions a Uganda free of violence and discrimination against women and girls. We do that through provision of access to justice through legal representation. We do pro bono representation of vulnerable women and girls who can't otherwise afford the legal services. We also do legal awareness, research and knowledge sharing. I'm super excited to be here, to be sharing with seniors in the NGO leadership as uh, we're not very, very old in the space. I also would like to extend my gratitude to the NGO forum for picking me out because I believe I must have done something right. <laughs> so I thank you for that. It's so good to see so many colleagues online from far and wide. We are working in Eastern Uganda, Eastern Uganda, Southern Uganda, from all over. Thank you so much for joining the discussion and we're looking forward to engaging. 
I'm going to share experiences of the Women's Pro Bono Initiative as we have faced them. First, um, but also to borrow a quote with the feminist movement that uh, the personal is very political. And as Jackie noted, if the personal is not settled, you may think the world is in chaos, but in most cases, the chaos is in internal from a personal perspective. As an institution, we have faced loss. Personally, I lost my father to COVID early January this year. Uh, one of our staff uh, tested positive with COVID uh, about a week, two weeks ago. So we have been dealing with COVID as an institution from way back. The experiences we have and are going through are quite raw. And uh, I think it was last week when we were having the discussion on grieving and honoring the lives that we have lost through Isa that I posted that I, I, I am almost at that point where I, I am fed up of crying. I, am, I have run out of money. <laughs> To, to give for condolences. I, I feel like saying RIP is not enough. We must do more as a people that are surviving this pandemic. I believe if you're online, you have survived at least this far. Life is important, life is precious, but how have we as an institution prepared ourselves? Since the first time that we went into a lockdown as an institution that we, we are, we just turned three years actually today in the space. Um, and um, what we have been doing is in the past, we developed emergency re response mechanism because part of our work is really frontline work. So we developed and um, spoke to our donors and partners and they supported us with toll free lines. So we have toll free lines for our clients to reach us if you need. Thank you everyone that is sending me <laughs> support messages. I, I see them and I appreciate you. Uh, we have toll free lines Our clients can reach us on online. You can reach us, they can reach us via WhatsApp. They can reach us on email. They can reach us on phone without having to pay a fee or a single dot of credit. All you need is your phone needs to be charged. Um, two, we, we allowed our staff to go and be able to work at home. Everyone is equipped with a laptop and data. So instead of buying lunch in office and spending so much on water bills, all of staff that works for WPI are equipped with a laptop and um, data, a data allowance to be able to work from their workspaces. We also have uh, weekly check-ins. We have paid Zoom licenses, Skype and all. So everyone is supposed to come online and we just, usually we are not talking work when we are doing the weekly check-ins as an office. We just checking on one, one another, finding out how are you doing? How are you coping? That's how we were able to find that one of our staff had indeed caught COVID and needed our support. Um, but also when the vaccine came, when government brought the first 900 vaccines and frontline workers were being fronted as uh, key and important people that should be. They were looking at people in the judiciary, prisons, police, health workers. We are part of the NCD Alliance, Non-Communicable Disease Alliance organizations working in that. And we fronted ourselves as frontliners because we are offering emergency legal aid. And more often than not, even when it's a lockdown, people will call us and say, hey, I'm in prison, I cannot afford to get out, or I'm at a police post, I am here. So we made a case through the NCD Alliance and through the Cancer Institute, all of our office staff were vaccinated with the, the first time. So we were all vaccinated, including security and support staff in our office. So we, in addition to ensuring that everyone has access to a box of masks, 
uh, sanitizers in case the client you come into contact with the client. Everyone in our office is vaccinated. And I, I, as a leader of the team, I had to make sure that the information, I provide information and learning platforms for the staff to be able to appreciate the importance of being vaccinated. So we took um, advantage of those opportunities to be able to, to be resilient with the times and move on. Indeed, as one of our staff reported that she had tested positive for COVID, she was asymptomatic. And this morning she sent us a message to say that last night for the first time she tested negative. So we're really excited as an office, even as we are working. And that has worked out pretty, pretty fine for us. The other issue I wanted to share with the leaders is the question of coalition building of like-minded institutions. Jackie mentioned that we need to review our grief policies, we need to know and have circles to connect with. Um, as emergency response people working on front lines, we, we noted that at first, even as lawyers, we, we were not uh, listed as essential service providers. So it was difficult to move around when women were calling on us. Everyone knows that violence, when the lockdown happens, grows or there's a spike in violence, gender-based violence. Women are faced with an indiscriminate proportion of work, the, the amount of work that is women are facing in the lockdown, taking care of everyone that is back in their space without any kind of equipment or knowledge on, in as to how to take care of everyone is so much. And that has created so much tension most of the calls coming into our offices are not necessarily that I want a divorce or I want to go to, to take this person to jail. Many times it is to speak to a lawyer to know what their options are, but also to just be encouraged that you can get around this. You don't have to come to court. And our Domestic Violence Act, LCs and LC courts within the confines of, of our community can take charge of this information. So it's been more information sharing, providing public health information and guidance, counseling, psychosocial support to our clients has been what we have been doing. But also we have continued with our work online. So instead of having to mobilize or lobby our policy makers currently, in the thick of the COVID pandemic, at the time when the lockdown just happened and people were dying every other day, we were looking at WhatsApps and everyone was posting RIPs. It was just during that time that the budget was read and we felt we needed to engage. Even as we were engaging, the, the comments we were hearing from many partners were, oh, how much is going to COVID? How much is going to oxygen? But then as women, we stepped back and said, okay, wait, so there's a scarcity of oxygen, but we know that out of every 10 women going to give birth every morning, four of them are going to need emergency obstetric care. They're not going to need cesarean sections. Some of them need blood and they need oxygen. What has the COVID task force done for mothers that need emergency obstetric care and some of whom need oxygen if all of the oxygen cylinders are now being sold and given to people suffering from COVID. Our constitution is clear that uh, women shall be protected, taking into account their unique status and natural maternal functions in society. Seems like most of those issues and concern were relegated really to fighting the COVID. Indeed, my mom called me and told me that, Prima, you know, when the lockdown happened, we heard in our local radio here in Luuka that there was a woman who walked from Ginger to come back to Luuka so that she can give birth with a TBA. And she almost died on the way someone had to carry her into a facility. But I mean, people were running away from the facility because there is a very strong fear that since everyone with COVID is in the facilities, you could go very healthy going to give birth and you end up catching COVID and your chances of survival. If you don't have the money bearing the costs in place, 
is so high. So we were having that discussion, and as Arthur has been mentioned, externally building this partnership with people who can engage for us and on our behalf and amplifying these voices is really important. So for me, coalition building, emergency response, and um, having partners and uh, supportive donor networks has really worked for us. And it is how we have been able to survive and continuously provide the legal services because we are still working. We are still providing emergency response and the legal services. We have been able to get movement permits. One, we are also registered as, aside from being an NGO, we are registered as a legal aid service provider. So through the law society, we are able to apply for passes but also through coalitions like the Coalition on Trafficking in Persons, we were told to submit our names so that Ministry of Gender can clear us to be able to move to reach the clients. So I believe if anyone is still wondering how they can get to move through the coalitions, it is possible to get a movement permit. But also I'd like to encourage us and all of us to encourage our staff to be vaccinated. I strongly believe that my team has survived the bad times of COVID because we were vaccinated and were able to take advantage of the partnerships to, to, to be where we are right now. I thank you. Over to you, Isabella. I was supposed thank to take- you. Thank you very much, Prima, for your submission. And um, in highlighting your experience, for those who might have missed off or jumped to the call, because I'm also very much aware of the realities of internet in Uganda. When the wind blows, there are certain areas where the internet goes with the wind. So, and that's why I keep, um, <laughs> that's why I keep doing summaries for, uh, for persons who might have missed that just in case uh, of anything. So Prima highlights the issue of, uh, in regard to their experience, the issue of, uh, them having 12 free lines to support with uh, their pro bono work. And I believe that has helped a lot during the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. The issue of weekly check-ins as a team, um, the issue of uh, you being, um, being essential workers because you were providing pro bono initiatives, but also the fact that you have merged psychosocial support into the work that you're doing as an institution and well done. I believe that more organizations should seriously think about that, especially within the second, uh, uh, the second wave. Um, Prima also talks about um, their look at the budget through a lens that very many of us probably missed out, the lens of emergency obstetric care within the pandemic and uh, looking at also oxygen and the fact that this is something that the COVID task force has probably not thought about. So when we go back to Arthur's conversation, on inequalities, that is another connection that we could be able to make. So thank you very much, Prima, for sharing your experience. At this time, I'm going to invite Benson Ekwe uh, from Public Affairs Center in uh, Soroti. But before Benson comes on, I'd just like to continue to recognize Mr. Asha wilson um from the Workers, uh, the Workers Association. I know that as a sector, we've been trying to build linkages with workers unions and with other uh, institutions. So Asha wilson Oweri, you're very much welcome. It's an honor to have you on the call. I'd also like to recognize uh, Mr. Marco Deswat, who is from the Democratic Government. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So without uh, wasting any more time, uh, Benson, are you online? Benson? Thank you, I'm online. Okay, you're very much welcome, Benson. And Thank just you a quick reminder, you have seven minutes. Thank you. Uh, I want to welcome all of you. and uh, I want to thank you for giving me this wonderful opportunity. There's much to share. Like Arthur said, that we have a lot to share from frontliners. But I equally want to say, we also get inspiration support and comfort from the, why do you call them top liners if we are front liners? So to us, PAC Uganda was established in 2006 uh, as a response to, there was a lot of talk about 
the elite running away from reality. So for us, we strongly believe that people with the brain power, that is the elite, if they work together with the, the people who have civic power, then there will be a transformation in this country. And it is on that premise that we started uh, our work. So we, we have gone on well, despite the, the challenges. We were back in 2019, or from that time, we started working very closely and participating and championing the national level campaigns at the subnational level. We got involved in a number of national level campaigns and collective actions that actually put us on the spotlight. And I think for the first time, probably government was relaxed, said, let these guys talk in Kampala, as long as our people at the grassroots are okay. But when they saw that we, there were now organizations at the subnational level, galvanizing the national level agenda, taking it deep to the grassroots, it attracted attention and we came into the spotlight and on the 18th of December 2017 our offices were stormed. The reason here that at that time we got involved with the, the campaign on the amendment on the removal of the age limit which is commonly known as Tojikwatako. In Iteso and Karamoja we championed it, we collected over 41,000 signatures which were published by the national team. And I think that did not go well. So we stormed, ransacked, raided, all our computers taken, about 13 of them, all the files. And from that time, they started following. It took us about six months to get another office. The landlord reacted, was ordered to get us office premises. Our car was taken and we went through a number of things, but we kept on. So what has helped us to keep on? For us in PAC, we believe in a number of things. One is that for us, we run what we call a grassroots driven civic empowerment agenda. We believe that the constitution of the Republic of Uganda places the total responsibility of promoting governance and democracy in the hands of the people. If you read principle of state number 17, number 29, and article 17, it talks about the responsibility of a citizen. And then article 38, it talks about citizen having a right to influence the way they are governed, either as individuals, through their leaders, and through civic associations. So it is on that that we premise our work, and all our work is built around Civic, uh, civic empowerment derived from building the capacity of the people to actualize what actually the constitution expects of them. We now operate at 10%. We nearly all of us in the organization from, seven, from December, from January this year are fully volunteers. We don't have any direct funding to support us. So everybody in the office is actually a volunteer, with Benson being the chief. So what have we done during this crisis? For us, a crisis is an opportunity to prove that we are people-centered. Since we got established, that has been our interest. Whenever there's a crisis, whenever there's a challenge affecting the people, we come in. And that has made and dear us to the people. Secondly, we strongly believe in a social movement approach. Building a collective move by citizen, the mass, the citizen, is a key. You can't do it without the people. You may mount pressure from the top, but without what I call the base pressure from the citizen, you are wasting time. The steam will always ex escape and the leaders will continue working in the way they want. So PAC stands to fight for the support and support the people's struggles. We have cases like TSI. This was a neglected island for many years. We raised it up. Today, if you go there, PAC is a, a darling. 
we stood with the people in Abim, Angisa, and many others. So the people's struggles is our agenda. Three, we are human rights. We, our work is around, built around human rights defending, standing for the vulnerable. And if you read Article 17 again, that's where we draw our inspiration. And Article 50, Clause 2 of our Constitution, which says you can stand for if another person's right is being abused, you can come in. So far, we have on record saved over 70 uh, widows and children whose land had been grabbed and a number of them and others have been given names to us because of success. So we build ourselves around human rights defending and that is what has kept us. So that is basically, now how do we build our resilience? One thing is that we, we are foresighted. In 2012, to 2016, we really got sizable amount of money from uh, DGF. I want to thank DGF for that. They helped us to expand our horizons and we did a lot. And I really want to appreciate DGF. Even the current facilities we are using was from that project. So around that time, what do we do? One, we got a loan, a, what they call a loan scheme from Standard Bank. That loan scheme from Standard Bank we directed, we asked our lead managers to build their own houses. And within most of them, within four years, including myself, I was able to get a house in town, get my own small house. So now when we are going through hardships, at least settlement, the issues of rent for our personal houses is, and these are the only staff who can now afford it to be volunteers and park. All of them are intact, none has left. But those who were not part of this have left. So I think to me, that is one thing. And then of course, so we kept well the assets we got. DGF gave us a truck, a community outreach truck, which is still intact. Through NGO Forum, we got a car, which is still intact. The computers we kept very well, only that they were taken by the police. That was the only damage. But that means every asset we have, Everything we secured was properly kept. And that is what has helped us. If you look at a car we got in 2012 from DGF and you see it today, you will think we got it the other day. So I think this is how we have built our resilience. The other way is that we have built strategic alliances. Locally, there is no district here that does not appreciate. So far, we have received invitation from about 80 districts to help build their, their local government, to counsel us, orienting them. We did, we have already done it with the city. We did the orientation of the new councillors. So our relationship, building the strategic relationships is a core element that has helped us to survive. So when you come to local governments, even when PAC was attacked, six out of 10 LOC files by then resisted and wrote letters to government and said, no, 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 this organization, this what is done, they don't believe what you're alleging. And, and, and that's how we got off the hook. So I think building strategic alliances is a key. So we have built such alliances with the media. Right now, even the programs we are running is because of our relationships with the media. Last week, we ran a program uh, with, under the scene project, and it was very amazing. We raised issues that were affecting people. There was a high level of brutality by the enforcement officers. There was a level of incapacitated regional treatment center and many other things. So these issues, when they came out to the fore, we brought leaders to respond. And as of yesterday, there is a tremendous change in the behavior of, of, of our enforcement officers in the region. And I remember one man came to me and said, we want to thank PAC for what you have done. We're really facing it rough. So it is through these strategic alliances. And now we have written agreement with about five radio, four radio stations that now want to work with us. Building grassroots connections and platforms. We are the pioneers of the, the citizen parliaments. 
and we started this with the, with the help from Oxfam in 2009. And today we have about 58 grassroots uh, parliaments driving agenda, doing their own things at the local level, empowering grassroots activism and many other things, <clears throat> building a social movement. So this kind of thing has helped. Even when we have no money now, the work is going on because it has been taken over and owned by the grassroots. To me, I think this is very important. The other one, of course, because of that, most of our grassroots leaders and actors have grown into big people. In Karamoja, we now have about four LOC richer persons who are our grassroots activists who have won. In Teso, we have close to around eight. Some are now even members of parliament. Others are LOC five chairpersons in the region. And we're already discussing on how they can continue and support the work. The other one is using or use of technology. I think what is now left for us is to use technology. So yesterday I had a meeting online or on, on a telephone meeting with my civic inspirators and they have already established a WhatsApp group. And this morning they called me, they want to have a, a Zoom conference with me at least once a month. So this is the only way of keeping ourselves linked there. I would like to go much. When you come to COVID, we contributed to the district task forces in the region in the form of fuel, technical guidance, advice. And today, PAC is the chief monitor of all, all, tax, all the work of the tax forces in the region. We independently monitor. I remember in COVID-1, there was a saga between, you know, the way government works. The, 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 the surveillance the unit was budgeted by both sides. There was the money going to the local government, they put them under that. But there was also money put for them under RDC's office. So the two, each one started playing a game. The local government would say, ah, ah you go to RDC's office. The RDC's office would say, ah, ah, you go to the district. And they came to us, we are the ones who managed to resolve the, the, the issue as independent monitor. So this has made us relevant at, at the, the current moment. And of course, what lessons have we learned as I conclude? Number one is that never rely on others to achieve your development agenda. This is a bitter lesson we have learned. We strongly believe that we can be driven to higher heights through grants, through donations, through what people give. And it became, it became a rude shock to us that you can imagine from 20, 2017 to death, we haven't been able to get any donor. We would have closed and wound up. But we said, no, I think the lesson is never rely. This is time to think creatively, like Arthur said. This is the time to organize differently. This is the time to look at things differently. Number two is that Build your mission around, around people's causes. You will never lose relevance. That is another thing we have learned. All that we do is around people's causes. Which group, which section of society is struggling? Is it businessmen? Is it the grassroots? Is it people who are moved everywhere? Is it the orphans? Our agenda is built around people's causes. And I'm telling you, that has kept us, and we have almost remained the only lone voice in the region because of that. Three is that necessity is a mother of innovations. The more squeezed we are, the more innovative and creative we are becoming. And I think already I've been discussing with our trust member of trustees, by next year we shall be announcing a major shift in the way we are going to organize ourselves, in the way we are going to structure because the current way we are structured is not helpful. Why? Because yes, of- So I'm going to have to stop you. So I hope so, you can your conclusion. So just a minute. I, I think lastly, the other one is be ready to rush to, to, to reform and adopt. And finally, 
build long-lasting relationships and invest in the people. So to me, I think this is the thing which is very, very critical. We won't thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Benson. And you bring us to the end of, uh, of the submissions. I have just been having a conversation with Chris and telling him that maybe we should have had more time for this discussion, given the fact that we now have only 20 minutes to the end of the the end of this dialogue, even if there's definitely a lot that people want to say. For those of us who have been following, there's been a very active conversation happening in the chat section. And if you have not been following the chat, I encourage you to go and follow the chat because there's an equally rich discussion going on right there. So at this point, we're going to open up to the to anyone who would like to submit. But before we open up to external submissions, uh, there's questions that have come in. I won't read out comments, but I'll read out questions, especially for the respondents, so that when we get back for the final uh, submissions, then these are part of the questions that I responded to. Um, Faith, Faith asked for more information on Nafasi and Ujasiri. Faith, if you could uh, type your email into the chat section, I believe that the NGO forum or any leads on Nafasi or Ujasiri shall be more than happy to get in touch with you and give you additional information on the two uh, spaces. Uh, Zahara asks a question on shimmering and she says, how can we shimmer more as a sector? And that goes to Jackie. Um, Zahara also asks a question on who determines essential workers and can civil society question this classification of essential work. I will leave that open to any of the panelists who would want to respond to that. Um, Richard Sewachi Yanga says, is there something to say about thinking globally? The pandemic is global, but it's forcing us to look at local situations. How do we close borders between the virus and body globally and not necessarily just close borders for people? I shall direct that question to Arthur, even if Richard had not specified who it would go to. Violet, Violet Alinda says, what would be the preconditions for shimmering to happen? And definitely that goes to Jackie. Jeff Wedulo asks, how do we continue to support local efforts in COVID within the COVID response? I will leave that to any of the panelists uh, to respond to. Teresa Egita is uh, asking a direct question to Prima, and she asks if you have any contacts or counterparts within the West Nile region because she believes that your work is very necessary in that area. Uh, coming in through WhatsApp, I have a quest I have questions from Sanyu Penelope from Farmport. And uh, the first question she asks is, what does care and soul look like in the pandemic, especially across the civil society sector, which is a question I will direct to Jackie. The second one is, who is documenting and who is healing institutions, especially with the fact that institutions are people? That also speaks directly to what Jackie was talking about, but also to what Prima was talking about. The last question, and I think this one should go to uh, Arthur, is who is preparing teams and institutions for the different levels of transitions that are going to happen as a result of the pandemic uh, context. Um, uh, the conversation is now open. This smile Pusemirero has had his hand up for the longest time since the, since the dialogue began. And so I believe that we should only find it right to start with him. Isma? Isma? No. Oh. Okay. Isma seems to be absent. Uh, Carol? Carol Nyangoma? Yes. Yes, yes. I think I'm yes. here. Okay. Uh, well done, team. My name is Carol Nyangoma, team leader, Warm Hearts Foundation. I'm glad to be part of the platform and appreciate all your submissions, amazing work you people are doing. Uh, my first uh, comment here is uh, from Arthur's submission that highlighted about the corruption in Uganda. Patrice Lumumba, an African, said that in Uganda we have gone from the stage of being corrupt, but not, now it's robbery, it's 
broad day robbery. So it, it's that bad. But she highlighted on the point of us uh, outdoing the current government or the current state. But how would we go about this? Because, you know, some things are, are easier said than done. And also it hurt me so much that the state sits down and uh, figures out who is essential and who is not essential. And to me, civil society organizations are the most essential workers ever because they are the ones that are on the grassroots, on the grassroots, like Warm Hearts Foundation, we are on the grassroots of ensuring that we kick out GBV and child abuse from the communities, but we are we are locked up. So if we can have a common voice as organizations so that we can defend ourselves and say, we are also essential workers, at least if they can get the list of all civil society organizations, I believe the data is there so that they can solicit those who can at least work and be allowed to move. Because like um, Prima said that we can do this through coalitions, but I don't think every organi organization can be able to have a coalition with a top governance or maybe a, a minister of gender. So can we have a common voice where we can all sit and be like, this is what we need because the communities need us. As warm hearts, we are stuck with funds to buy food from, from corner women and sanitary pads because we cannot move. Yet it's this time that these same people need our services. And also on the point of, uh, of resilience, we also need to keep um, a record keeping right and we also need to keep our data in place because uh, as you can see, the government has been messed up because they could not locate who the needy people are. So as organizations, do we have these records if they um, approached us and asked us, can we avail them to, to the responsible people? Yeah, that's all for me. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Carol, for your submission. And I know that it ties in a lot with what Benson was saying. And, and I know that Arthur might want to respond to that, especially around the conversation of social security safety nets. But thank you very much. Uh, we will go on and hear from Karen Moa, Albert. Thank you so much, uh, Isabella, and everyone that spoke this morning and uh, so far the afternoon. It's an amazing discussion. And first, before I submit, I would like to request that such conversations continue to happen because we cannot uh, we cannot um, uh, talk about everything on this uh, short time that we have. But uh, my submission goes to all of us. And I want to encourage all of us that we have the capacity as CSOs to beat every challenge hands down, if and not when we agree to join hands. We ought to keep moving together because th that's the only way we shall break this kind of uh, resistance. And that is how we are going to sustain our resilience. The existing human rights abuses and the challenges in families are because someone did not plan well. And that is also because somehow the civil society organizations were not involved in the planning process. And that is where we have those challenges. And also uh, that someone who did not plan well also planned to fail and they did not take action from the technical persons. So unless this, this challenge is fixed, like Jackie said, we are in for more challenges and more pandemic if, unless something changes from what we see today. The difference uh, that I'm seeing between ordinary and extraordinary is the little extra that we have to do as life has no limitations. So let's make this happen as civil society actors. We, we, we have the potential and we have the capability to change everything that is surrounding us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Albert. And uh, before I take Kayango John, I'm going to ask that once you finish speaking, please put your hand down because I don't have um, I don't have post rights and can therefore not put your hand down. Yes, but uh, Kayango John, would you like to submit next? Okay, we don't have Kayango John. John. Kaganga so, John, it is not oh, Kayango. Oh, sorry, Kaganga. My apologies. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. I'm just sharing three things uh, from what, what, I, what I have learned. I'm Kagaya John from Chikandra Environment Association in Mitiana District. Uh, I have been, uh, I, I tested positive, but now I have te I'm testing negative. But what ha have I learned? I, ha I learned that uh, we have these big networks like uh, Uganda NGO Forum and other networks where we are working. 
but we have not been keeping them sustainably because if it was not the networks which have been keeping so sustainably, I wouldn't have survived because those people took care, a lot took a lot of care to fundraise and get money. Otherwise, if as a farmer I couldn't manage, that is one. Two, uh, we there is a big big problem which I, I would like you also to think about as a forum that we are talking about people who are working uh, hand to mouth, but you have to also to take a note that. Even our government is working hand to mouth. Otherwise, if it was not, it would be feeding its people, it would be caring for its people very well, and so forth. And that's why a very peanut was, has been given to some of the few people, and it cannot feed us. Therefore, as we are talking about other people that they are working hand to mouth, and they are not serving, but also our government should be serving for such a problem or such a crisis. And once such a crisis come, then it would be serving its people. It would be helping its people. Because as Arthur and the other presenter have said, uh, so many crises, so many pandemics are coming. But are we prepared? Are we, how, what have we learned? Thank you. Because of time, let me stop there. Uh, thank you very much, John. We will then take Asha Wilson over there. Mr. Owen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I want to appreciate the presentation by all the people who actually presented in the morning. And I want, first of all, to thank the CSOs for the good work you are doing. For us, as trade unions, we are really uh, working hard to see that we improve on the livelihoods of the workers. But there's a lot of challenges that we are facing that we need to pattern between the CSOs and the, we, the trade union leaders, to see how we can work together and uh, promote the interest of the people generally. I was impressed really when Jackie was emphasizing on the rights and, and actually the welfare of workers. And when Larock came in, he, he even added more weight when he was talking about the unseriousness of both governments in the world and governments in, in Africa, which we must clearly take that we need now to take center stage and ensure that we as people who struggle for the human rights, put governments, put all those in positions to create and improve the lives of people and also ensure that the, 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 the rights and the, the welfare, the social economic empowerment of people is at the, the forefront. Now, what I would like to see with the CSOs and the trade unions, we need to have a rapport so that how do we build our, how do you build the synergy on how to rethink and work together? Because when, once we formally work together, we can be able to overcome most of these challenges. I, I want to appreciate yeah, you are, I, I've learned a lot from the presentation and I want to promise that I will engage you, the leaders, and we see how we can work together. I thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Owere. And we will then have Miriam. Miriam to, yes, Miriam. Miriam, would you like to come on now? Hold on. Yes, Miriam. Miriam. Hello. Hello. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Miriam Tsasiri. I'm, I'm the director of the Innocent Voice. Yes, Miriam, Hello. please go ahead. Do you have a question? Yes. <clears throat> yes, I have a comment and sharing yes. my experience, a brief experience of what we are going through. Okay. My NGO reaches a hand to children who are born in prison and also 
those that are left home at the time of imprisonment. And I imagine during this time where every parent is keeping their children in the house, but here we are having mothers who are in prison and there is no one to take care of their children. And uh, we're supposed to reach out to those children by giving some assistance, basic needs and also counseling. But then there is also a problem that some members have mentioned about the essential workers. We're not supposed to cross from district to others, to other districts. Also, we are limited on the visitation of pre the women in prison. And that has been a big challenge to us. And I'm also grateful to Prima, who has been there advocating for those people in prison, also been doing in connection with the legal aid project here in Imbarara. So I think it is of good importance to have this meeting, and I think I've gained a lot of experience and knowledge from this. And um, building strong relationships with other NGOs is of great importance because it also strengthens the NGOs that are upcoming. So I think we should also look at those children in prison and outside prison as well, always look at the street children and also the orphans. Imagine a child is left home. This week I visited a family of five children whose mother is in prison because of eating some. She was a treasurer of a certain women serving group. She embezzled their money and she was taken to prison. Later also the husband followed and the five children are in the house being taken care of the 11 year old boy and the last born is two years. So I think this comes to us to always um, be a shoulder for those families. And also we can partner up with other existing organizations, not only reaching a hand to the sectors we are in, but you come like, if you're advocating for some other people, we can always come and work together to save the nation. I thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Miriam. And we will take Michael Aboneka next. Michael? Thank you, Isabel and uh, Arthur uh, and, uh, and Jackie for the presentations and everyone. I learned a lot from this. And to me, what I see is uh, the issue of resilience uh, like has been emphasized, that just reminds me that as a sector and as individual organizations, we need to take that seriously um, because we, we don't know what is going to hold after COVID-19. And yes, I agree that now this is an opportunity that we need to take as individual organizations. Uh, what do we take resilience um, to be? what do we have in place uh, what are the mechanisms of survival uh, and many have been shared but i think as a takeaway we need to to go home and sit down and ask ourselves those questions and implement and come out with something that as organizations as individuals there is a need for a plan not just a contingency plan not just a miscellaneous plan like we always do but a plan that it talks about how to be resilient in any circumstance. Today it could be COVID, tomorrow it could be a coup, the other day it could be more civil society. What, how would we deal with that? The other question to me is the collective, collective about the efforts we've been doing on COVID-19. I understand there are several efforts that have been happening, both at, at accountability level, um, at, 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 at the governance level, but I think it's important for us to have these collectives together, coordinated. Uh, for example, I don't know whether we still have the seat at the National Task, Task Force at the Civil Society, what is happening there. So I think that it is important for us to have these coordinated efforts together and make sure that we are able to document them and work together collectively as a, as a, as, as a voice, especially on this pandemic and uh, moving forward. Because I know that the colleagues in the refugees area have done quite a lot in that thematic. But now COVID-19 is presenting challenges in every aspect 
especially governance. So how do we work collectively? I think it is, I may not have the answer, but it's important that we work collectively. At least we know who is working on what and how do we support them? Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, we'll have Fred next, but before Fred comes in, I know at the beginning of this dialogue, I promised that we would be done at exactly 1 p.m. That does not look like a reality right now. So I'm going to ask for your kind indulgence uh, and we stretch this by about 15 minutes so that we can be done by 1.15. Thank you very much. So Fred, very briefly. Okay, um, I'm called Fred and I work for Citizen Initiative for Democracy and Development Uganda. We are based in Bukit sub-region. I want to say that uh, there is a lot that we have learned from uh, this kind of engagement. And uh, as an organization, uh, we are actually members of the district task force, but uh, based on what we have actually been able to experience the task force uh, is the fact that uh, the task force, district task force has a lot of gaps. And for a matter of fact, if civil society does not work up, we are not about to move anywhere with the district task force because uh, most of the district task force, I think, um, the way they, they, they do the discussions and then the way they, they are ready to uh, respond to the pandemic is actually leaves a lot to be, to be desired. Uh, like for instance, um, maybe I would also uh, hinge a little bit on our position on the national task force. I don't know whether we still have that space. Uh, we, we actually specifically went to uh, an aspect of generating data for the district task force to be able to take informed decision. We do rapid assessments as, as an organization and these rapid, uh, rapid assessments actually always inform the discussion. And as I'm talking right now, actually there's a district task force meeting going on and uh, uh, sharing some of the findings that we have done. But now when it comes to national level engagement, yes, we have issues that can be responded to by the district task force, but there are also some policy issues that need to be discussed at the national level. And this is the time probably as civil society would be able then to filter through our reports, through uh, our position uh, as civil society at the national task force. I don't know whether this one is still possible because we have these reports, uh, just in case it is possible, please let us know so we can send the issues that we, we feel are not responded at the, the, the local level to the national level for purposes of, of discussion. Now, uh, specifically, I want again to probably briefly talk about CSOs that uh, there's, there's an aspect of no laxity for CSOs. Joint effort synergy building has been a little bit weak. And most of the civil society, I think, have left this for local governments to handle. Members a call again, as, as I was saying, that uh, there is need to reawaken ourselves and no, probably position ourselves to, to take the right position, but also to support the cause of the people for whom we, we represent. Uh, thank you for now. Uh, that is what I've been able to uh, submit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. Uh, we're going to go in and take Fred Kawoya. And uh, before Fred Kawoya comes in, I know that we are in a period of <laughs> of technology and adjusting to it. Mm -hmm. So it has come to my attention that some of you are putting up your hands physically on that video. My apologies, I didn't see that. So just raise your hand uh, through, the, there are hand options somewhere. So please raise your hand in the hand options and then I should be able to see that. But again, I, in the chat section, I also said I wasn't taking anyone after Florence. So if you put your hand up after Florence, my apologies, I won't be taking you. So Fred Kawoya, please submit. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Arthur. Uh, thanks, Jackie and everybody for submitting. Uh, I think as Arthur has stated, uh, one critical aspect we need to consider as we talk about resilience is being more situation aware. And I observe that most of the conversations are focusing on the current, on the current uh, reality as presented uh, by the crisis. But I wish to invite us to um, uh, uh, give attention to the post-COVID, especially trying to uh, come up with scenarios on the future development outlook, because I 
we are certain that development paradigm is likely to change. But for me, the question is how is that change likely to impact on civil society and the citizen? In whose interest is the new development uh, likely to work? And how are we pushing the agenda, taking advantage of the immense evidence that, uh, you know, an opportunity that COVID has presented to push for what would work for the people? Of course, picking from uh, what has happened in the past, as has been well articulated by Arthur, the failed um, economic paradigm, the government withdraw and the focus on the private how are you using those lessons to push for uh, the changing paradigm? How is the donor uh, and the aid architecture, how is it like to change? I think for me, that futuristic scenario building will be important for us to prepare so that we do not become reactive when it happens and befalls on us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. And then we'll take God Bender. Reverend Grace Kaiso, you have put up your hand. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, let's have God better. <laughs> yes, thank you, Sabira. Um, and thank you, uh, our, our presenters and the panelists. And thank you for uh, for the, the different ex uh, persons who have shared experiences. My name is God Bender. I'm the country director of World Voices Uganda. And uh, definitely, uh, problem, just a quick one is that. Uh, We've been able to develop what we have called the COVID resilience and business continuity plan, which covers all the different aspects of how buildings, uh, you know, become resilient in the short, medium, and long term. And I think it would be we would be happy to have some probably more time to share uh, such a documentation. I think it's a, it has been a very great experience, you know, going through interrogating all the questions regarding both internal and external. And I think some of the issues have been raised uh, that fall uh, uh, within what we've uh, put in our plan. The second one is just building from where uh, Frederick Kawoya has, has stopped. I think we need also to integrate more uh, to in, uh, interrogate more about the political economy around uh, around COVID. And I think uh, we need to look at it from the perspective of the fact of the uh, that. Uh, um, the questions of whether actually civil society is needed at this point in time, and if it is needed, what is its stake in the political uh, economic equation? And then, how about government? Do you think government is interested in this, or actually they would want to use the the situation to continue propagating themselves in power, but also probably propagating, uh, you know, them, themselves into the schemes of generating more money? you know, to control the, you know, uh, all the factors uh, uh, of, of production. So I think that's why you hear the debates of uh, Professor Ogwang and others. And of course, that's why you, uh, you, you, you hear Agnes talking about the equity in terms of global vaccination and blah, blah, and, and Richard bringing aspects of expounding the debate, the debate to, to global. So I think for me, we need also, Arthur, you need, I think, to, we need to look at the political economy around um, uh, the, the COVID and, and who are the entrepreneurs of the same. The last one is uh, the issue of defining our space. And I think I saw a, uh, 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 a, uh, I saw a post from Sarah Mukasa or from Wasea. And it was, she was bringing a very pertinent issue saying that, uh, 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 could it be that idea would, with the civil society wants to replace government? Because in the event that we begin doing what government is doing, then actually we are motivating it to be more upset. So <laughs> I think for me, those are, those are, that's a discussion that I think we need to, to ponder about. So that we look at, because ideally what we are supposed to do, one, we are supposed to make it, to make it awake, but also probably do some kind of complementary, you know, uh, support, especially where we think that, yes, something uh, would have been done, but there's, uh, there's little that's been done because of some of the inevitable circumstances. So I was thinking that now, like us, how we have adopted the, the, home, uh, the home and the village, you know, best care legal age is a little bit amazing. 
And uh, we have engaged actually uh, some of the districts and they have agreed that actually while we are we are under lockdown, life is continuing. People are continuing to grab land, people are continuing disputes are continuing to, to enlarge. So I think we need to a uh, little bit uh, expound, but also probably also define the kind of coordination, the collective efforts that we are talking about in terms of fundraising, in terms of, so what is it that actually we're talking about when we say collective coordination, collective support? What is it that actually we are talking about? Thank you very much, Isabel. Thank you very much, God. And I know that this conversation is very exciting and interesting. And there's all these hands that are coming up even after my advisory not to put up your hands. So I, so I really don't know what to do with all the other hands, but I will maintain that I will not be taking them except for two hands. I will finally take um, Reverend Grace. And he has seen who is in the field raising his hand in some <laughs> garden. <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to take Reverend Grace, guys, so because I do not want the Holy Spirit to depart from me. And then I will take Yasin, who has been raising his hand the entire time and I missed him. And we will close the chapter on hands. So please put down your hands. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, I had also said I would take Florence. So let's take Florence and then we'll take Reverend Grace and conclude with Yassi. The rest of you kindly Good. put down your hands. Don't make me become like a teacher. Put down your hands. So Florence, you thank you hand. very much. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for picking my hand. And in the interest of time, I'll just be on spot and uh, on point. Uh, I want to thank all the presenters and the people who shared the experiences. But I really got worried that in this pandemic, for example, instead of the government increasing the health budget, they cut the, the health budget. So I'm talking about like all these insights are good and would be implemented. But how about these progressive laws, which are continuously shrinking the civil society space? How are we going to take up some actions to hold the government accountable? And yet, when you talk, some, some organizations, they freeze their accounts. They raid your offices. Uh, what are we going to do now as an action so that we at least uh, care for, uh, support each other in case our offices are raided on, the accounts are frozen, because those are actions that are intended to shut up all the civil society voices. So for me, as we wind up, I'm interested to see that we come up with an action plan that will enable the CSOs to claim their space and speak whenever there are things that are done and we are not comfortable with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Grace. And uh, then we'll go to Reverend Grace Kaiso. Uh, I'd the like- rest of the people, feel free to use the chat section to put your questions, okay? Just use the chat section. I'd like to appreciate very much the, the, the resource persons and for the inspiring conversations and input we've had from each other. I think my, my concern here is, uh, is that we are caught up in an environment of unknowing. There are no experts, nobody has the answers. And, uh, and I think civil society being diverse as we are, we have different networks that are focused on particular aspects of our work, like health, like education, uh, like local government. So I'm thinking that this being a very, a space that is really available for, for creative thinking, uh, we should be using it to the maximum, particularly as civil society using our networks. For instance, the networks in education should really be reflecting deeply. How do we restructure the education uh, environment in our country, you know, because COVID has highlighted the gaps that they are. Um, and we're not talking about repair here, we're talking about reform and innovation. Uh, the same with health, the same with local government, the, 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 all the areas that we are focused in, in trade, 
And, and I think the burden we have is to come up with input, you know, because we know that government has established different uh, task forces in education, in health, and I think in, uh, in, in business, uh, private sector. But we need to, to resource these task forces because we are the experts in these areas. And I think in that way, some of the thinking that we have, some of the frustration that we have gathered in the old normal, then we'll find a new space as we rebuild the future. So the call for me is to reimagine. Let's reimagine the future afresh. Let's not try to repair, you know, get things organized as they were before. Even our own setup as society needs reimagining. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Reverend Grace. And uh, finally, Yasin. Yasin? Yasin, are you there? Oh. Hello? I'm there? Hello. Yes. Hello, Yasin. Yasin is there. I apologize, are you but I didn't me? see you. Hello? Hello, please submit. Yes. Yes, yeah, um, I'm happy to be on this forum. I'm happy as a the villager, you can see me in the farm. Uh, these are the lessons we have learned from COVID. We have learned to remove our ties and we have back in the gardens. We are producing a lot of food and the organization is happy that now there is a market for food. And uh, what I wanted to share with our members, one, that NGO Forum is doing a, a good job to link us and connect us. But there is a lot of work NGOs are doing down here on the ground that you need to tap and be able to report about. Mm -hmm. Two, some of our organizations, like some of us, who have some work here in our gardens, in our farm. We are producing milk, we are producing rice, maize, uh, mangoes, and we're on the market. We are engaging a number of youth. Uh, during COVID, we had to think and leave some of the work, as Jack uh, said. We had to let some things go, and all our executive guys became frontliners who are touching the ground. We designed a bamboo project. We are planting bamboo trees along the river Nyamwamba, Sewe, Mubuku in the Renzo region. This brings us on the ground. We are creating nursery beds. We are engaging very many and we are calling other civil society organizations that seem not to be having work. Come and join with us. We have on our friends from German, Voga EV, they have sent us support. Ministry of Water and Environment, they have a lot of money to plant bamboo. This money came from Norway. We have this information. And some of our organizations that think that there is no work during COVID, please get in touch with us. We can link you. We can engage you. There is a lot of work. You come at my farm. There is a lot of food, Jackie. There is a hand for you here. And if you can reach here, we have But we can't cross districts unless I walk. I walk all the way for a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to organize a road trip, Jackie, and we shall all go and visit Yasin. But thank you very much, Yasin, for your submissions. Uh, they are very welcome. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation in the chat room. And before we go into, before we go back to the panel, I'd like to apologize that we are going to miss my, my second deadline of 1.15. Hopefully we can be done at 1.30. Uh, so I'm going to ask the panel to respond as briefly to the so many issues as possible, but also I, because this is the first of very many dialogues, I believe that there are, there are threads of themes that have come out from the conversation that can become questions that guide our future discussion. So even if your question is not, uh, is not fully responded to, I want to believe that with the NGO forum, there will be a possibility of that question being expounded on in future dialogues. So without wasting any more time, I'm going to invite, um, I'm going to bring the panel back and I will start with Prima. And after Prima, we will go to Benson and then we will come to Jackie and close with, uh, we'll come to Jackie and then go to Arthur and close with uh, Moses Isova. So Prima, would you like to submit? 
Uh, yeah, um, I'd like to thank you all. Thank you for being part of the discussion. I think I only, I've been getting direct messages on the chat and I've been making an effort to respond to, to those. Many people asking for my contact and uh, how they can work with us. I have shared with most of you that expressly shared that. Um, but also someone uh, publicly asked if how we can uh, reach out to people in West Nile. Uh, the Women's Pro Bono Initiative is a registered legal aid service provider. We are part of the Legal Aid Service Providers Network, but also the Uganda Law Society. Through the Uganda Law Society, there are offices in West Nile. There are offices in Arua, um, Kitgum, and Gulu. If you want to access us online, we have a toll-free line that is available on our website, but you can uh, inbox me. I can give it to you. We are able to, to, to speak to clients on, online. Our line is toll-free, so your client only needs their phone charged to reach us. They don't pay credit to be able to speak to us. We can do Zoom calls, but also, as I mentioned, we have permits to reach out. So if we need as an emergency to represent the client in the court of law, then we will do the appearance. But we can speak on phone, we can speak online, we can uh, find a way to support you in that regard, given the circumstances at hand. Um, aside from that, I, I, I am excited to, to reach out and to tap into the networks that have inboxed how we can be a part of that. Thank you so much and back to you, Akiteng. Isabella, please. Thank you very uh, much, Prima. Thank you. And we will go, we'll take Benson next. Benson, are you around or has the network fallen into the water swamp? Benson? Okay, please submit. Yes, I want to thank everybody for this has been quite a very candid discussion. And my quick reflection is that one is that for us to remain relevant, let's support the people's causes. Pandemic has affected people yesterday when we were in the other day having a talk show in Mora. The women raised and say, now that the president says, if you have to be picked at home, you should contribute. What about us? What about us? I think running our agenda and programs around what affects people than what affects us is more critical than ever. And this is the only thing we can do to build the, the public support for our courses to stand with. And then secondly, the sector is quiet on, on, on issues of the misuse and abuse of the resources intended to fight COVID. We're even quiet when there is a war breaking out on a local initiative like Covitex. Uh, uh, so what are we doing? I only see the media struggling through their investigative journalists. I've seen the NBS, and now they are coming together with other media houses, trying to poke into this issue of abuse. 10 trillion was released and acquired through donations and loans, and it has gone to waste. Where are we in this? I think we are, <clears throat> we are absent. And then finally, I think we need to organize now differently. We need to organize, like Arthur said, if we continue moving in the way we are, I am very worried. As a sector, we shall disappear like other trades and industries have disappeared. So I think let's organize differently. Let us see how we can actualize accountability and ensure we perform our duty of protecting public resources under Article 17, even under the pandemic. Let us not go on a leave. I think we need to wake up like the media. Can we team up with them? Can we work with these journalists? Can we do what? For us in this region, that's what we are trying to do. We now work closely with even investigative journalists. And they raise these issues, we work with them, and I think this is the best way. It's time to build synergies, like somebody from the, the trade union said. We can no longer afford to be what we are, thank you very much. And I wish all of you 
quite a nice time together. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benson. And so next time, Jacqueline, you like to come in? Jackie? Isabella, we, we can't hear you. Would you like to join us now? Jackie? Oh, okay. Sorry, Isabella, I couldn't hear you. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, I, hope I'm, I'm, I hope I am clear. I don't Absolutely. even know how to end this necessarily. I think the conversation actually doesn't end. It continues. There are issues that we are grappling with, and, and I spoke about what are our internals, what do they look like? And, and maybe I just advise, or not advise, I request that we each reflect on, on what it's been like to lead in this pandemic. Um, thank you for those that shared what they are doing internally to help support uh, the systems to continue um, and the staffing and all those things. So we need to learn from each other. Please share that we can, so that we can learn. Um, one thing that, that Andrew has put in the chat, which I also thought about in terms of what is our relevance in COVID and as we think of shedding, are there, you know, we need to, to face the question about our relevance as, um, and here I'll, I'll, I'll bracket it to the NGO sector, although I know that we have um, others, you know, trade unions and, and religious leaders and everything. Um, but yes, what, I think to really critically face what is our relevance in, in a time of the epidemic and our pandemic, and what, what are the things that we need to shed that no longer serve us or serve those that we are serving? Can we raise those questions and, and face ourselves um, at, to answer them? And then I think ab around um, shimmering solidarity and care, again, a continuing conversation. I know that a friend was, was, was challenged if I speak about the issue of care when, um, you know, it, it's locked down. One of your staff members is really, really struggling and finding it hard to still continue living in the capital with their family. And they say, you know what, the best thing for me to do is to send them to the village in the middle of the lockdown. And you understand that, yes, he's facing the existential threat of the landlord might come and throw the family out. The family don't have enough to get food every day. But how does that staff member organize to take his family because they can no longer afford to be in the city? What does a leader do? What does a leader like that do? Faced with those kinds of situations um, that again, like I said, maybe we never had to contend with because all you saw were mm -hmm. the bodies that are in your space as office. But now our eyes have been opened to the fact that people have other lived realities, even as we talk about lockdown and, and the social distancing and all those things, school at home and everything. So what does it mean for us indeed to, to be truly more family-friendly workspaces? What are the ways that we need to change? What are the things that we need to change? What kind of conversations do we need to have um, either with you know, NSSF, the workers' unions, our donors, so that we are truly embracing of institutions that care inwardly in order to care outwardly? Isabella, back to you. And, and on shimmering, of course, we need to continue that conversation. How do we truly um, what, what does true solidarity or better solidarity look like? Thank you very much, Jackie, for your submission. I'd like to invite Arthur. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Isabella and everybody. I do not want to be uh, the reason why Isabella fails on her third deadline. But there was <laughs> just you. one question. I would encourage uh, NGO Forum to just put together an outcome document from this conversation with the major you know, points about the future that we can come back to, like Jackie said, to continue the conversation. But I do think that some experiences such as by God, by Benson and others really can become the pillars of how we advance this conversation in a practical way. But just one point that Richard uh, raised about thinking globally, uh, we used to say, yes, think globally, act locally. It's still pretty much alive. And yes, I agree. But um, the global conversation at the moment, I feel, Richard, that it's, it's controlled by the same agents that have created the crisis. And like the saying goes, um, we cannot get new ideas you know, solutions 
from the same thinking that created the problems. So Richard, I am persuaded. I am persuaded that indeed we need a global response to the global pandemic. However, we've also learned that uh, there are some quite enterprising local solutions that in the meantime, in a, in a time when every border is closed, we can invest more in. So uh, Cuba has an exciting story about vaccine that nobody has talked about. WHO has not recognized, nobody cares, but they are, they are making some, some ground. Um, um, we have our own story about Professor Guang. And, 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 you know, before we get lost in the confusion that often social media brings, this is a real, a, a real experience that has been exposed by COVID. Again, the opportunity that COVID has presented is that we know Professor Wang and his 17 and 20 years work on, on hubs. I think the future, um, Richard, is global uh, response, but driven by South-South solidarity and the knowledge in the South. So South-South cooperation is going to be key because we share a lot more amongst ourselves than worrying about uh, you know, what the UN might do before it is reformed. So I think that um, this is where we should spend a lot of our energy to just make sure that global South-South happens and the knowledge that we do have can be taken forward. So uh, the challenge is back to NGO Forum, but I will look through all the comments and respond to questions that were directed to me uh, at some point through the NGO Forum. So back to you, Isabella. Thank, thank you, you thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur. And um, thank you for being mindful of my deadline, which I now have two minutes to. And so I'm going to invite Moses uh, to make the final submission on behalf of the panel, and then we will close. Moses? Thank Moses, you yes, yes, I'm here, Isabella. <laughs> thank you very, very much, uh, Isabella, for the wonderful moderation. And thank you uh, to all our good panelists, Arthur, Jacqueline, Prima, and uh, Benson, and of course, for the, all the different interventions. We really are humbled as NGO Forum uh, because of this very rich conversation. Uh, just some quick things before we get off the call. One is that uh, all this conversation is going to be harvested into some you know, outcome document, which we'll certainly share with you. Uh, so that, I mean, you know, uh, it's not all just uh, said and left here. So there would be some document that will come out of this. I, I just want to quickly speak to a few things that I know people are raising up. One on uh, the fact that you know, as a sector, we, our movement has uh, been curtailed uh, because of the decision by the government not to consider uh, the sector as essential. As uh, the Uganda National NGO Forum, we, we've tried uh, to approach the Ministry of, of Works and Transport to be able to see if we can get uh, uh, vehicle movement permits for the sector, and that uh, this has uh, not been successful to date. Uh, but this is an effort that we would uh, commit to continue pursuing because our work is critical, especially at this time. Uh, the other information that also we, I would like to give to the sector uh, is, the, is our presentation on the National COVID Task Force. We've been uh, in uh, conversation with the office of the prime minister and, uh, and I've been in, uh, in touch with the permanent secretary uh, about our seat on, on the table to be able to, to provide our input. And uh, the, the, at the beginning we were told we are represented by Red Cross. I don't know if there is anybody on Red Cross uh, from Red Cross on the call. But uh, suffice to say that we are still pursuing this so that we can actually be able to put our voices on, uh, on the table uh, of the National Task Force. And we'll be informing you uh, what, the, what we get from the Office of the Prime Minister. Yeah, but uh, again, this is a very uh, rich conversation that we as NGO Forum, I mean, we could see there were so many hands, there are so many questions uh, very rich, and uh, we can offer that at least within the next two weeks, we should be able to reconvene again to be able to take this conversation forward. So we will be reaching out to you in the next two weeks to be able to reconvene so that we can actually be able to speak 
uh, you know, perhaps this is the, you know, the start of our shimmering as bees, shimmering to be able to, to see how we can uh, engage uh, the gorillas. So uh, when you get our invitation, please uh, respond. Uh, so once again, I would like to thank you so much for the, taking the time to be on the call and uh, thanks so much and stay safe uh, and, uh, as we go through this pandemic. Thank you so much and God bless. Uh, thank you very much, Moses. And uh, we have finally come to the end of this dialogue and I'm one minute past my deadline. And I am very sorry that I kept you this long. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the organizers and on my own behalf, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for sparing time to be part of this first dialogue organized, uh, first leaders dialogue series organized by the Uganda National NGO Forum. Like I said earlier, there's been a lot of themes that have emerged from the chat box. And I believe that those themes shall be very instrumental in pointing us into what directions we need to have. I know that there's, a, there's an underlying theme on education. There's an underlying theme on donor relations and existence within the sector. There's an underlying theme on psychosocial support. There's an underlying theme. So there, there's a lot of themes. So thank you for all the conversations that we've had in the chat box. They are very important to us. And so I would like to close um, with the words of very intelligent, interesting man who posted the words in the chat box. And he said, our relevance may be as simple as to stay alive. And that was posted by Mr. Richard Dewachiyama. So as we close, please stay alive. Please mask up. Please uh, observe the standard operating procedures. Please limit your movements. There are some of you who are looking for permits to move from district to district. That may not be the best thing to do right now. Limit your movements. Uh, try as much as possible to support the community. Move for my chicken. And um, your chicken and to your sin. That chicken needs to appear in Kampala. I am not sure how. So from us to you, have yeah. yourselves a very beautiful afternoon and we will see you at the next dialogue series. Goodbye. Thank you.